Guided selling from Ring DNA makes your entire sales team more effective by revealing exactly what reps should do and when to do it. Guided selling works by transforming sales data into a curated list of prioritized sales actions. So when reps start their day, they'll never again wonder which prospects and accounts or hot inbound leads to reach out to next. Guided selling even shifts reps' priority in response to real-time buying signals. Finally, even new reps can sell like seasoned ones. Let Ring DNA be your guide to success. Learn more at ringdna.com slash guided selling. That's ringdna.com slash guided selling. We were having a conversation one day comparing stuff, and I started going off on these tangents about products. And he was like, how the heck do you know all of that? And I'm like, well, I had to learn all of this to be able to do my job. And I'm like, you don't know this? He's like, are you kidding? I'm like, well, what do you do when people are asking you a question? He's like, I tell them it's FM. And I'm like, oh my God, what is FM? And he's like, it's effing magic. And I'm like, oh, you do not. <laughs> you get by with that. And he's like, yeah, they laugh and we move on. <laughs> Hi, friends. Welcome to the Sales Enablement Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Paul. Now, that was Sally Doobie. Sally's the Chief Sales Officer and Partner at The Bridge Group, which, as many of you know, is a leader in inside sales consulting and implementation. In this episode, Sally and I dig into a wide range of interesting topics. We start by diving into how to create more diversity in sales, particularly in the tech space. And Sally and I also have a discussion about whether those people who are you know, head of HR, head of talent, whatever we want to call it these days, as well as sales leaders, talk about whether they should be setting concrete goals and s- steps to improve diversity. And we talk about how to get more people of color and women into leadership positions in sales. We also talk about a related topic, whether having specific technical expertise or experience is necessary in a sales management role. You know, I think there are a number of, well, maybe a small number of industries where some sort of technical experience, if not expertise, is, is necessary in sales. However, most of the times, personally, what I've seen is that sort of these experience requirements are really just excuses to exclude candidates and perpetuate the old Boyd's network that oftentimes exists. So we're going to get into that and much, much more. But before we get to Sally, I want to remind you to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. And if you subscribe, we'd certainly appreciate it if you could also give us your feedback about how we're doing in the form of a review. So thank you. All right, let's jump into it. Sally, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much, Andy. It's great to be back. I miss chatting with you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. So uh, you moved recently. I did. I did. I made the big jump from the Bay Area to Denver. Ah, to reasonable real estate prices. (laughs) <laughs> yes, back to sanity. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. So you're enjoying like being at altitude and having a winter? Um, I, I do like the four seasons. The winters are okay. I came from Michigan years and years ago, so I yeah, know okay. winter. No big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's an adjustment after being in California, but I mean, I somewhere I grew up in Wisconsin, spent most of my adult life in California, but then. You know, as you know, 10 years ago, I started time-sharing between New York City and, and San Diego. And, and you know, people always say, well, how do you handle the winters? And it's like, well, compared to <laughs> growing up in Wisconsin, <laughs> not very difficult. Yes. Yes. It is somewhat easier. I mean, we can have 60, 70 degree days, and then the next day we could have eight inches of snow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. That's the thing about that that area there is... I had a, a virtual assistant that was working for me out there. And yeah, I lived vicariously through her. And she was talking about, yeah, one day, just as you said, 70 degrees, next day, eight inches of snow, two days later, 60 degrees. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, you just never know. Keeps you on your toes. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's good. A little unpredictability is good for all of us. Um, so we're going to talk about several topics today, but we're going to start with talking about diversity in sales. I mean, you've written about this recently in an article in Forbes magazine. Uh, yeah, I know it's something you're, you're passionate about. So the first question, I guess, is, is this lack of diversity in sales, is it worse in tech than other industries as far as you're, you know? 
Well, my gut says yes. I don't have any real statistics other than I meet a lot more women in sales roles, you know, in other industries. I mean, real estate, finance, you mm-hmm. know, all seem to definitely have a lot more women um, in sales and tech. I've been in tech and I'm going to date myself again, but I've been no. tech for, <laughs> for over 30 years and, you know, it's gotten a little bit better, but it's still not where you would think it would be in 2020. Oh, I have to agree. I mean, as you said, you don't think a lot's changed in terms of diversity and sales and tech in, in the past 30 years. Yeah, I've been in it for even more than that. And <laughs> um, yeah, I, I can almost make the argument that it's it's worse because you would expect a certain rate of change, a certain trajectory of change over mm-hmm. three or four decades. Yep. And given the fact that that we don't notice any change means that it's probably worse, right? I mean, that's how I look at it. Given yes. there's been no improvement, that means it's actually worse today than it was there. I mean, and why, why do you think that's the case? So, you know, I think there's a multitude of reasons actually for it. Um, you know, some maybe outside of tax control, but, you know, I think that women for many years didn't think of a career in sales. Um, And obviously, I think as we all know, too, there's not a whole lot of schools out there. Last I knew a few years ago, there was only about 30 colleges and universities um, that even had a sales program where you could actually get a degree in sales. So before then, you couldn't actually take a sales major. Um, So for many people, I think it was just like, well, I didn't get my degree in that, so I'm not going to do it. And I think the um, the culture in sales and how we have in the past always uh, described being on a sales team, you got to be a killer, you know, you got to <laughs> do that, is a not, yes, yeah, just not something that appeals to many women. And so I I think it discouraged people and it wasn't a lifestyle. If you think of the traditional field sales role where you're always on an airplane and traveling and, you know, never home at night, that is also something that doesn't appeal to many women and doesn't work with a personal life for many women. Right. Right. Well, I mean, so There's certainly the issue with diversity in terms of women in leadership, women in in sales roles themselves. Uh, When it comes to diversity, let's say racial diversity, it's as, again, the progress is as dismal as it is, if not more so, than with women. Yes. And, you know, I think it kind of goes back to some of why are there more women. When you've got so many men in there, you know, people tend to hire people that look like them or people that are in their network. And so you've got, you know, men, they're just used to hanging out with other men and that's their network and that's who they've worked with before. So that's who they continue to hire and look for. And I know from my past experiences as, you know, a sales leader, when I was hiring and I was trying to purposefully hire more women, it's really it is hard to find. You get, you know, maybe one out of 10 resumes are from a female or a person of color. And so you have to go out of your way and make a really concerted effort to try to find those people and to search out those people. And it's going to take longer. And I think in the world of tech, anything that takes longer is not well accepted. (laughs) Um, (laughs) You know, and I know many times I had to tell, you know, my boss, they're like, why is that position not filled yet? And so, you know, I'd have to kind of, you know, play a little game and just say, oh, I just haven't found the right person yet. In reality, what I was trying to do was balance out my team and find a woman, find people of color, and it takes longer. Yeah, I mean, I... There's so many cultural things that you refer to. I think that the play into it is is 
remember having read the stat uh, a little while ago, but then read it again. There was another article, I think, last week in the Washington Post about this, is that you know less than 1% of VC money goes to black entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. Think about that. Less than 1%. And so the conclusion, I think it draws that, you know, best case scenario, there's this implicit bias there. <laughs> Worst case, <laughs> explicit biases. But I would think that, interesting in your opinion, it seems like some of that trickles down to the entrepreneurs themselves is they must be aware of this, right? If they're trying to hire senior people, uh, women or people of color is they have to look at the VC as an example. And it's like, hmm, is that going to be perceived as too risky? Yeah, you know, I, I personally don't think from the ones that I've talked to, I think many of them just don't even think about it. It's we need to hire somebody and we want to do it quick and get on board. So it's either a referral, right? So again, it's coming from your the Golden Boys. The Golden Boys. Yeah, it's coming from the good old boys network. I mean, and it's not I think the thing that's fascinating is not just people that are are around my age group uh, that's creating this. When I look at the younger demographics and the younger CEOs, the younger managers. Um, you know, we work with a lot of sales development inside mm-hmm. sales teams with 10 B people much earlier in their careers. And when we go into these companies, I mean, it is the good old boy network at its finest, even though they're being managed by a millennial. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's, it's nothing, you know, has changed between age groups, even though I think the younger generation wants to think. Um, that they are more progressive and more aware of this. Right. <laughs> I don't see yeah. it. I don't see it in the tech workplace. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things you you wrote about is is that <clears throat> we're saying that you thought that you know HR functional leaders need to set you know concrete goals for improving diversity. So, what would these be in your mind? Yeah. So you know, I think they have to to come up with when they're hiring what percentage of people or what percentage of people in the team do they want to be either women or people of color and then they work to strive towards those goals and you know if it's not coming from i mean ideally this is coming from the top down the ceo is saying this is a company initiative we're going to do better. We're going to make this happen. And mm-hmm. they're working with, you know, the chief of people, HR, whatever the role is called in the company to set up these kinds of parameters and give guidance to people in that are in the recruiting and in the hiring positions as to how to go about and do this. But, I mean, we're starting to see, obviously, in this time, of what's going on in the country, we're seeing a lot more of this. I'm seeing a lot of job openings for, um, you know, head of diversity at companies, Mm -hmm. which is awesome. Um, But I think as a hiring manager, you don't have to wait for, you know, for it to come from top down, you can do it yourself, right? And so again, I mean, some of the things that I talked about, um, in the post that I wrote was one of the things I really liked was, you know, if you ask people on your team who um, are part of the good old boy network, if you will, for a referral, they're going to give you more people that look like them. Mm-hmm. If you specifically say, like, who's the best woman salesperson? that you've ever worked with who's the best person of color in sales that you've ever worked with and you start getting really specific (laughs) about what you're looking for you're going to start getting obviously different answers right and different results um and so we've got to really do things a lot different than how we've been doing them in the past And we've got to go different. You know, I think one of the things, um, Andy, that you and I were just talking about before, before this was, you know, some of our requirements that we put in or the way that we were job descriptions, Mm 
You know, if you're putting in, you're looking for somebody with a killer instinct to go hunt. I mean, those things don't resonate with women. So change what you're looking for. Change your wording. Make it something that's going to appeal more to women or people of color. Show, you know, show diversity on your website. Um, you know, we usually see things on websites of employees, you know, they're playing basketball or they're playing mm. foosball, right? I mean, those are things that women are kind of just like, mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily excite us, right? Um, you can also, um, you know, start putting things together that specifically, again, are going to get you outside of your normal network. For a lot of these positions, do we really need them to have a BA? No, I think that's, that's, that's a great question. I mean, if that's, if that's a barrier, then yeah, that's, that's a barrier that needs to come down. Because that's, that is, I don't know. Have you used your BA in, in your sales? No, and my BA was in hotel and restaurant management. <laughs> yeah. mine, yeah. mine, was, mine, was, mine was in history. I mean, there you go. <laughs> yeah. You know, and as we were just saying, there are no, you know, there's very few now. Back in my time, there was no one who had a sales major. Um, so it didn't matter. Um, you know, I, I would. And, and experience. Why do we need? If you're in the security, we see this all the time. The security and the security part of tech is really, I don't know. I, I guess they think they're more complex than everybody else. And it's always you've got to have security experience. Well, how are you going to break in these new people, and you know, women, women and people of color, and give them an opportunity at a starting role? if you're requiring experience and why do you really need that security experience? Yeah. You know, everybody got started in sales without having a security experience and they got their first managed. job and managed to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do want to come back to that one. I, I, I think the critical point though is, is for me, as I think about this is that we just need the diversity needs to start at the bottom, you know, at the entry level people in sales, uh, because that then forms the pool from which future managers and directors and VPs and CEOs are developed. And and I agree. I think these things you, you've talked about is do we need BAs? Can we do more aggressive use of internships? Yes. Uh, bringing in uh, women, people of color, students as interns into sales to expose them to profession and, and so on. Hugely important, right? Because it's it's... Yeah, we we just need to get people in doing yes. the work, and then be able to develop them from there. Exactly. And, and we have to be serious about it. I mean, I I I always look at. I've talked about this example before, but you know that NFL put in a a rule to try to encourage uh, the hiring of minority candidates into head coach and senior coaching positions. And it's been available, I don't know, for for um, for a while. <laughs> yeah, almost twenty years or so, and and it's had no impact at all. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's it's like it's one thing to have the rule in place. I mean, seventy percent of NFL players are black, and less than ten percent of the head coaches are black. In fact, the same number of head coaches this year in twenty twenty black head coaches in the NFL as there was in two thousand three. But it's what, amazing, what, isn't it? What dictates, though, is what drives that is that most of the most of the head coaches are drawn from the next tier down, right? Just like mm -hmm. in management, right? Yes. Probably my VPs from my directors, my directors from my managers. Well, the next tier down, yes, is primarily what the offensive defensive coordinators on pro teams are mostly white men. So, you know, the pool is always starts drawing from the experiences. We got to get people into our entry level positions. Uh, more women, more people of color, and and I said I love the internships. I love we, yes, really looking at. We don't need a BA degree. Most, yeah, you know, we've had this inflation of people rushing to colleges in the last forty years. That's you know, people have to get degrees to be you know admins these days. I mean, it's like why? You know, it's just become this this bar. So let's. I agree. Let's let's look at yep. taking that away. And I and I think your point about making sure management teams know how to hire, how to interview, how to remove the the 
you know, unconscious biases, if you will, out of the mm-hmm. interviewing process. I mean, one thing that people are doing that's that makes so much sense is, and this is what I advocate as well, is you use standard interview questions. Oh my God, I was just going to bring that up, Andy. Yeah, so that, that is so, so that spot when, on. When someone's being interviewed, is is if you have four people that are interviewing them during the course of the day, those four people all ask the exact same questions in the exact same order. So when they get together and debrief, they're using a standard set of you know, criteria to evaluate the person. Right. And you get so much more out of it when you give people the questions they need to ask for the role. I mean, because I quite often, you know, we're always like, okay, so why do you want to hire that person? Well, I really like them. Well, okay. <laughs> what else is there? That, you know, there's got to be a lot more as to why you want to hire somebody besides you like them. And what that is telling me is that you really don't know how to interview. And you didn't know what questions to ask and you couldn't get any really good information, but they were really nice. And maybe you had a really fun conversation BSing. Well, but that's the whole point about standardized questions. Is you, that's what that, I said. Yes, exactly. That's part of a, part of a system of, yes. that I advocate is having a scorecard that you assign yep. point values to various things. And it could be interviews is just one of the things you're evaluating, but is, is yes, let's make it more data driven. And less subjective, and I think that's that's at least one step that companies can take yes. to try to get more diversity into their workforce. Exactly, and really being able to understand the what it takes to be successful in the role, and that things like the degree, you know, things like previous industry experience, you know, you can teach people product stuff. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, you want somebody who's. So and that's, curious, that's only what, yeah, what tech companies are the best at is teaching people product stuff. They're not good at teaching people how to sell <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> or do well, any of that other well, stuff. Well, we're, we're going we're gonna to get into that in just a second. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, because that's, that's a question I want to ask you. So, but I do want to get back to your question about, you know, is, is you know, if you're in an industry and you're hiring a salesperson, do you need to hire someone with that industry experience? Because uh, uh, to your point, is is it easier just to teach the product side than finding someone with, you know, the sales skills you need? And uh, I have to admit, I go back and forth on this <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, I'm an example on one side of you know, as I said, I was a history major, but I've spent, you know, prior to starting my business, spent 25 years selling very complex technical products for the most part, and. It was funny. I was very successful at it, but there were certain things that that I felt somebody with more technical background could do better. So it wasn't like it was a complete you know yes or no. Because on the other hand, I made a career of taking engineers and turning them into salespeople. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, you know, I really always said, "Oh no, engineers don't have sales DNA. That that's so hard to teach." It's <laughs> like, yeah, actually, no. I felt it was a lot easier to teach the sales skills than to teach the <laughs> the detailed technical <laughs> stuff that they needed uh, in several industries I worked in. You know, but again, I think even if you have some previous experience, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to come in and get up and running at a new company with different products, maybe different messaging, different, you know, features and benefits, mm-hmm. right? And for salespeople, So I'm going to tell a story. This was years ago, but a good friend of mine worked at Oracle with me and um, he was in field sales. I was in inside sales and we were having a conversation one day comparing stuff. And I started going off on these tangents about products. And he was like, how the heck do you know all of that? And I'm like, well, I had to learn all of this to be able to do my job. And I'm like, you don't know this. He's like, are you kidding Like, well, what do you do when you tell people, you know, when people are asking you a question? He's like, I tell them it's FM. And I'm like, oh my God, what is FM? And he's like, it's F, F in magic. And I'm like, oh, you do not. You get by with that. And he's like, yeah, they laugh and we move on. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, well, that's one way. But the other way is a lot of field salespeople, they, they do have an SE. Yeah. That is with them on every single, what used to be in our not too distant past of field call, right? Mm -hmm. Or they also have them on phone calls a day. And inside you don't have that one-on-one 
preparing to be able to do that. Right. So you learn it in quick order and you end up being able to talk circles around <laughs> around your counterparts. So again, I think you learn as much as what you need to be able to sell the product. But in most cases in reality, don't you think Andy, that what's much more important is how do you convey and find out what, what the person really needs, how you can make them successful in their current job. And you stick to, for the most part, higher level business value conversations than getting into the nitty gritty and you get the tech people together to talk tech. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Which sort of gets back again to the original point is, is, you know, are you looking when you're looking to hire salespeople, are you looking to hire specialists or generalists? Mm -hmm. And, and, yeah, I think if it's from a, just an industry perspective, right? Um, yeah, I tend to lean toward generalists. But if there's something, you know, you're selling chip design equipment or chip manufacturing equipment, yeah, I'm going to lean probably toward a specialist. You know, I'm going to want a seller with yeah you know, maybe a double E background or something like that that that's yeah you know, understands the fundamentals. But yeah, I think for the most part, I sort of lean toward the generalists. Yes. I agree. And I find this interesting too. We have a lot of people that are very specific when it comes to a, a, at the leadership level, whether it's a sales development leader, an inside sales leader, you know, a field sales leader, um, you know, is that they're looking for that industry experience. And, you know, I know from the SDR and inside sales that if you understand what makes sales development teams tick and how to work with sales and marketing, that the product side is so less important to developing a really good team that mm. will blow your socks off. I mean, I've done it myself. When I went in, I went from doing the database stuff into a company called Network General, which got bought sure. by... I forget who now. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it was network clients or one of those, but anyway, because um, this was years ago. And it was a really, really technical product. And I was just like, I don't know any of this stuff, but did I build a really high level functioning sales development team and inside sales team? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think that I think that that one of the perspectives that people don't look about in or look at at hiring sales is, you know, we use the term generalist, but I, I, I sort of sorry I used it because I actually don't use that that term anymore. I call them sales specialists, and and it's a something I think we need to really develop as sort of a term is this, okay, well, I'm not just a salesperson, this is somebody that really understands sales. And how do we, how do we gauge that, right? Because, yeah, I, I always harken back to this quote, one of my favorite quotes of all time from this uh, British philosopher, uh, Thomas Huxley, was, was, you know, in life we should try to learn something about everything and everything about something. <laughs> and and that sort of describes the way I've lived my life. And I think about, okay, well, yeah, I'm, I read widely, a hugely curious individual. I, yeah, try to know something about everything. But the one thing I know everything, I think I know most everything about, but obviously I don't know everything about it. But it, the thing I'm trying to learn everything about is sales. Right? I mean, yeah. so I think as a salesperson, you really don't want to be a generalist. You want to be a sales specialist. You may not be a security industry specialist or whatever industry you're trying to get into. But if you position yourself as a sales specialist, you can verify that by what you read, what you, you know, things you're learning yes. and so on. That becomes pretty powerful. Yep. Absolutely. I like that. I like that. You know, I, and I, I, I totally agree. I think that we need to get to really down to the brass tacks as to what do you need to look for. And it's, you know, it's a little bit different based on the role of the position. Yeah. Right. If you start at the SDR level, you know, you're looking for some 
general qualities and skills that can translate into with the right training and coaching being a good salesperson, right? Like mm-hmm. good communication skills, the grit, the emotional intelligence, you know, perseverance. I mean, I think the curiosity is a great one. Are they always wanting to, you know, just ask questions, whether it's, um, you know, internally to learn more about the company, right. the product, their buyers, or is it when they're on a phone call with, you know, with a prospect that they're asking questions, yeah. right? Um, you know, are they motivated? Are they internally motivated um, to do the job? Because this, you know, the jobs are hard in sales. It's not easy. <laughs> um, no, and, no, that's- never been easy no and you know does it bother you when people say no to you or hang up i mean you can't let those kinds of things bother you i remember when i was selling insurance that was my very first insurance job Mm -hmm. and literally um i was selling business health or health insurance to businesses and literally it was knocking on doors just going to a big you know business park that's how i got started yep yeah. And, you know, literally knocked on doors. And I remember going into one just, and there was a sign above the receptionist desk that said, we shoot every third salesperson. And the second one just walked out the door. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you got to just laugh. And I turned it into a joke and had them all laughing and got in to see the person I wanted to see. But, you know, if, if you're too sensitive on some of those things or take things literally, <laughs> you know, I'm sure a lot of people just looked at that and turned around and walked right out the door. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've started my own similar when I was very early first few months on job as my territory was the East Bay or the Bay area from Fremont to Fairfield. And, uh, went out with a senior salesperson to go on a call and, and he was selling, accounting systems or selling computer systems is with an accounting application for uh, CPA firms to help run their business to it wasn't, I guess was there tax prep involved? I think there may have been tax prep involved. I can't remember, but certainly for business operations for CPA firms. And yeah, we get to the door of someone's CPA firm. He was going to cold call and yeah, sign said, you know, no salespeople. And he goes, <laughs> Bark. he goes into the front door and I'm with right behind him and the receptionists and sort of this atrium says, can't you read? <laughs> and, <laughs> and he said, he said, I can very well. He says, but you know, I'm not here to sell you something. I'm here to help you improve your business operations. And you know, for me, that was like eye opening, right? <laughs> it's like, Oh, yep. <laughs> that's how you do that. That's how you do that. <laughs> that's so, great. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, you know, and it, again, I think it goes back to, you know, who's going to be the more successful salesperson? And yeah, do you need somebody with those technical skills or somebody that can turn it into a business value conversation like that person you were just talking about? I'm here right. to tell you about how to improve your business operations. I'm not talking tech, technical stuff with you, <laughs> right? And yeah. At some point in time, that's probably going to have to come. But again, there's other resources. There's other avenues for that. Well, yeah, his thing that stuck with me throughout my entire career to this day is, I'm not here to sell you, I'm here to help you. And I think that's a, a, a mindset that most salespeople completely miss out on. <laughs> they think their job is to sell something as opposed to help somebody solve a problem. Um, absolutely. absolutely. So <laughs> this gets to a point that, that we had touched on earlier about how sales training is, is lacking. <laughs> uh, and so I've got this, I've, I've got this theory. So let me run it by you. And I've been asking lots of guests this recently. So, so I oftentimes ask people how they learned how to sell, right? Saying, setting aside their experience, which everybody has their own experience learning, but you know, who, who was the big influence in them learning how to sell? Was it a coach and a mentor? Was it uh, of their peers? Was it a customer? Was it their own, you know, personal work they did? Um, or was it company supplied training? And so far, again, this is 
not scientific, but you know, just talking to a lot of people, is the thing that's always most influential in people really learning how to sell are coaches and mentors. And we know there's also research that says, you know, the, hey, the single biggest thing you can do to provide a big uplift in sales performance is more effective coaching. Mm-hmm. So, if that's the case, we spend $20 billion a year on sales training in the United States, of which a small fraction is spent on training and enabling sales managers, coaches, <laughs> how to coach. So, wouldn't we be better off flipping those amounts and spending, let's say, $19 billion a year training managers and a billion dollars training salespeople? I love that. And I totally agree with that philosophy. I think this is where there is so much upside for companies. And, you know, again, we see it all the time is that, you know, you have an SDR rep that was an SDR, maybe first job out of college, and they were an SDR for six or nine months, and all of a sudden, they're an SDR manager. And they get absolutely no training. Mm -hmm. They get no mentoring, they get no coaching themselves. But yet they're out hiring people. And they don't know how to hire. So it goes back to that first problem that we were just talking about. Um, and, and now, and they don't know how to coach because they were never coached because their manager was at the same, you know, that, that they had before was at the same sort of level as they were. They had just right. recently gotten promoted. They don't know how to coach. They had never received coaching. Um, and so, you know, it just keeps getting worse. And one of the things that we are doing a lot of now is actually we're coaching first time managers on these things. How do you properly coach? Why do you want to coach? How do you, you know, where should you be spending your day? What is the most important thing that you should be doing to Mm -hmm. impact the success of your team? And so going through all that and making them understand this is really what the job is about. And the most impactful thing you can do is spend time on coaching and how to do it. And then, you know, I, I have this conversation every week with a couple of people I'm mentoring, you know, they're like, I am trying really hard to coach. But my VP comes and wants this report. He wants me to do this in Salesforce. He wants this done. He or she wants this done. And it's like, and my coaching time keeps getting less and less and less. Okay. So let's stop there. (laughs) (laughs) Here's, and this is going to sound too simplistic, but I'm speaking from personal experience. The answer to your VP when they want you to come do that stuff is just to say, no. I mean, Uh, you're hiring me to do a job and that job is to generate certain amount of sales. I don't have time for that report. I don't have time to do that thing that you want. So what do you want me to prioritize? Giving you a report or selling something? And and this this conversation, people, you know, there's so much fear inherent mm-hmm. in the way that sales is structured and operate these days. It's like, yeah, I had a, <laughs> a boss at, at one point who asked me, said, don't you ever just say yes to anything? <laughs> and the answer was no, because this is my job. You gave me this job to achieve a certain thing. It wasn't to produce a certain number of reports. It wasn't to do that, you know. I'm going to focus on, you can fire me if you don't like it, but I'm going to focus on getting sales. Yeah. This is what you hired me to do. And I started that, my first management job. Yes. All the way through, you know, being CEO, senior VPs at companies, talking to CEOs. No. You want me to do certain things? No, I'll, look, I'll think about that, right? Yeah. See if it makes sense. But I've my priority is I'm trying to, get this quarter done. I'm trying to get the year done. Yep. No. Well, and, people and need to start saying no. Exactly. Or figuring out, I mean, you know, it, it's hard for, I think people that are early on in their careers to know how to properly work. do I that. <laughs> I know. I was. I just I said it. And, and, I'm and not, I love I'm, doing that too. I'm, I'm not a huge think. risk taker. Yeah. I'm not, yeah, I'm not, but I'm, I'm, you do have to take a risk. Yes. You know, the people that, that get ahead in sales, you know, 
the common thread is they break the rules. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not that it's not that they you know do anything unethical or whatever, but they understand what's the biggest priority, and they're going to focus their time and effort in getting the biggest priorities accomplished, and they're not going to let anything stand in their way. Right. Right. Don't get your weekly report done. You don't get your weekly report done. Yep. Fire me. I'm 110 percent a quota. Yeah, I that is my big um, advice to a lot of the people that that I coach a mentor or talk to is you don't necessarily have to say no first say, okay, here's what's on my plate. Help me prioritize is coaching and making sure my team really (laughs) achieves their goal for this month. Is that, is that still your most important item for me? Or you want me to go try to figure out how to run this report and get this data for you. Right. And when you start putting it in perspectives of what's most important, you know, most most sales leaders that I've done this with have backed off and said, you're right. Yeah. Right. You know, they're so doing it because somebody asked them for it. Right. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah, that's your problem. Right. Yep. So, yeah, I, I, I think in this, you know, having be, being able to have those conversations instead of just being the yes person, because you think that's going to keep you. In good, good with your sales leader. <laughs> for some some people, I guess that does work, and that's what they what the sales leader is looking for is just yes people. Um, but those people are probably the ones that I would never want to work for. <laughs> well, and it's the people that the people that say yes are are the ones that just you're not right. going to achieve what you want to achieve. achieve. Exactly. Right. I mean, it's like, come on. Right. You have no one is looking out for you except you. Right. Right. You may have a good boss on occasion that that you know you really bond with and they they've got your back, but by and large, <laughs> you know, the only one looking out for you is you. And so it doesn't mean to be selfish. I mean, you want to be a team player because that's going to help you. You have the right mindset, but you also got to get your job done. And you know, they may say, <laughs> you know, I had this, this conversation once with a CEO at a startup I was working for. I inherited this organization that was not doing well. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and the CEO thought the answer, and we were sort of, we we're selling outsourced services for managing networks and so on. And, and he thought the answer was to hire a bunch more people. And I and I said, well, you know, here's the problem: you've got, or I have people that that you haven't been able to, you have an organization that can't sell these people, right? <laughs> so I'm not going to go hire more people until we learn how to sell these people, right? And and I had P and L responsibility for this organization, and I finally said to him, I said, look, dude, I can go hire these people, but if it doesn't work out, you're going to fire me. But if I make this a profitable organization, and continue to grow sales while I do it, yeah, we may not be hitting your growth forecast. Are we making money and we're going to understand how to do business, right? How to do this business. And he just, yeah, backed off. He didn't, it's like, you know, if you don't like it, fire me, but I'm going to do my job. Right. And that is such a key point. And I think things in particular in tech where it's like growth at all costs. And so you're just hiring more people, but you're not making the ones you have successful. Exactly is kind of craziness, but yet we do it all the time in tech. (laughs) It's the mindset. And everybody in tech seems to think that scaling means just adding headcount. And no, you you know, it doesn't do you any good to hit headcount if they're only going to produce at 50% until you figure out what that magic sauce is that you can actually then take and replicate. You figure out how to sell this properly and who your right buyers are and who's your right target market. And then you can look at successfully adding bodies. But yeah, it's a novel concept to be worried about profit. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I just think the, the giving yourself the freedom to say no. Now here's the, here's the flip side of that. You got to perform. Exactly. So if, if, if you're not performing. If, if, someone, if someone asks you to do something, you say, no, I don't have time because I'm hitting my number. Then you got to hit your freaking number. 
Right. But, you know, we can help all people learn how to hit their number if they're open and prepared to learn and, and work hard. But that's, uh, you know, you want to take that risk, then you got to be prepared to back it up. Exactly. And, and I think, like I, you said, I always was. Yep. It does start, I think companies would be a lot more successful if they made their frontline managers more successful and focus them on exactly how to coach, how to make, you know, their teams work, how to instill that team concept. I think one of the things we're lacking today, and this is a totally new subject here, but is um, a sales culture. Sure. In a lot of these companies, you know, I just don't see sort of the intensity, the energy, the, I'm going to do whatever it takes to hit my number this quarter, this month. Yeah. Well, I think what's happened is it's evolved into what I call a selling culture as opposed to a sales culture. And so, yeah, we've got this process. We've got our tech stack. If we throw enough crap into the top of the funnel, we're going to sell some stuff. And that's, that's a selling culture as opposed to what you're talking about. Sales culture was, yeah, I've, how am I going to make this number? How am I going to scale, right? How am I going to work with my customers in the most effective way in order to scale this, this company the right way? And, you know, one is a very thoughtful approach to how you work with your customers and how you perfect a repeatable business model as opposed to just a brute force way to address it. Yeah. Good point. But it's just, you know, that intensity, the, the, the drive. I mean, there were many, I know working at Oracle, you know, it'd be like a closing out the quarter and I wanted to be not just at a hundred percent, but I wanted to be at 120% and have my accelerator kick in at 120%. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I would go to it quarter to 12. This was again, back in the good old days, go to the San Francisco airport and pick up a FedEx envelope <laughs> off the turnstile and then drive it to Oracle headquarters, get it yeah. date stamped and time stamped to show that it came in. <laughs> for an order, yeah. yeah, yeah for yeah. an order. And then I would actually go down and package it up. I'd go into shipping and um, package it up and yep. put a label on it and make sure it was waiting out on the dock for the FedEx shipment. Yep. <laughs> Been there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> Those are some fun times. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, different environment, but but it does you know, speak volumes about, yeah, what what are you prepared to do within I said <laughs> within the bounds of you know being ethical and, and legal. But I mean, what are you able to do to push yourself to yeah. Do what you need to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, yep. yeah, it's it's uh, yeah. We're you talking about grit, and so on. It gets back to sort of the the hiring process we sort of started talking about at the beginning. But but also, I think it, part of it is you know, we talk about sales enablement, but I think part of it is self enablement. It's mindset. It's yeah. This whole thing you talked about is you know, do I have this this uh, growth mindset that that says yeah, I can. I can learn how to be this way. Yes. Yep. We've got, um, we've got some work to do, you know? And so I think that there's, there's definitely some good tools out there to help companies as well to determine, um, you know, when I'm really familiar with uh, OMG that, Mm -hmm. you know, they have a short survey and through, uh, they've tested almost 2 million sales people and sales leaders at this point in time. So they've got really good data and science to back up their findings, but they can determine sales DNA. Does this person have the right sales DNA? And that can be broken down into, are they better suited for hunting or better suited for the farming role, right? To really help give you some guidance. And I think especially now in today's world where, you know, we're being told when companies are putting a job posting up for every sales related job posting, they're getting anywhere from 200 to three to even 400 resumes in. Mm -hmm. So no one can spend the time screening (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, for that, um, which, right. which kind of goes back and complicates some of our other issues that we were talking about on getting more diversity in the sales teams. But there's got to be ways that you can, you know, uh, apply some science to this to figure out who and narrow down your pool of candidates yeah. Yeah. in better ways. Cause it's just, it's, it's tough these days and you want to see everybody get hired, but yet as a past hiring manager, you know, that's and being a manager of a sales team, that's not your only job, but it's a very important piece of your job. So you've got to become as efficient and effective at that as well. Right. As right. everything else that you're doing. All right. Sally, we've run out of time, but great conversation as always. Um, if people want to contact you and connect with you and learn more about you, how can they do that? So you can find me on LinkedIn at Sally Doobie, D U B as a boy Y. Um, I'm on Twitter as well. So feel free to reach out and connect with me. We'd love to hear from you. And thank Perfect. you so much, Andy. This was awesome. Love to love the discussion. It's always fun to talk with you, Sally, and we'll, yeah, we're not going to wait so long to do it the next time. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Okay, friends, that's it for this episode. First of all, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. I'm so grateful for your support of this show. And I want to thank my guest, Sally Doobie, for sharing her insights and wisdom with us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to this podcast, Sales Enablement with Andy Paul, on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you could also leave us a rating or review and let us know how we're doing, well, we'd certainly appreciate that. So thank you again for investing your time with me today. Until next time, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. RingDNA is the leading sales enablement platform that uses AI to help scale business growth. Trusted by the top companies across the globe, RingDNA offers a suite of powerful tools for every sales role. The RingDNA dialer radically improves sales productivity and call connection rates, while guided selling helps reps know exactly what to do and when to do it. Conversation AI uses artificial intelligence to surface the most impactful coaching opportunities in real time. So no matter where your team is working from, the RingDNA platform can help them exponentially increase call connections, opportunities, and revenue. Learn more at ringdna.com slash platform. That's ringdna.com slash platform.